Every Easter, all of the saints come together and we celebrate what? We're the body of Christ. We are God's extension of his love into this world. And everything God touches is made new. Welcome to New Life and to Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday from my family to yours. Happy Easter. Um, one of the things, I read a quote this past week, okay? And it said this, it said that, um, you know, that uh, one of the assumptions we make in communication is that the illusion that it's happened. Have you been there before? 
you thought you communicated and the people are like, I have no idea what you said. Okay, so like on Easter, this is something a pastor does not want to miss, right? Like I do not want to miss that right now with you guys, okay? So here's what I want to do, okay? And I need your help with this. I want to start with some assumptions that I have that I need to say so we can at least start with some common ground, okay? So, all right, so here's one, okay? So I got three. The first is this. I think that you're here to celebrate Easter. How do I do? Right? One for one? Huh? Yeah. There's a tradition that uh, followers of Jesus have done for centuries on Easter. And uh, what they do is, is a bit of a, it's a call and response. And I actually want you guys to do it too, okay? And that is where somebody will say, he is risen. Okay, you went to the class, okay? Okay, but if you didn't know what to say, now you know. Now you know. So sometime today, you're sitting at a table. You're sitting with some friends. You're walking alongside the road. You see somebody and say, he is risen. He is risen indeed, okay? So number two, assumption, okay? My second assumption, my first, you're here to celebrate Easter. Secondly is this, is that you're here because New Life is your church or you're with somebody and they're a friend or family member, New Life is their church. Or you're checking us out. And if you're any of those three, it's fine. It literally come as you are. But I do need to say this. We believe that the church is not a building. It's not a business, right? It's not the moral police. The church is the body of Christ. The church, that's what Jesus thinks. The, tree, the, the church is about people and relationships connected to each other, connected to Christ. And we're here to serve our communities, support each other, love each other, and worship God. And so one of the things that you'll say, because at New Life we just like to say, hey, some things are closed fist and the other things are open, open hand. Good. Good. Man, you guys are smart. And, and the open hand stuff, this is all the stuff that we can debate, disagree, and we should discuss. We should be able to do it respectfully. Uh, but we don't divide on this stuff. Um, the closed fist, this is the stuff that we say, we, that we're going to agree on this. And, and, and we just think that over the centuries, followers of Jesus, this hasn't been a big list. It's been like, no, there's, there's God's real, okay? The Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the deity of Christ that God put on human flesh, right? Uh, salvation by grace through faith, that, that we're saved, not by what we do, but by God, what God did for us through Christ by his death and resurrection. And that the spirit of God's alive and that the church is his body and we have a mission in this world. That's it. And so if you've always felt like, man, I just feel like a church should be more about relationships. Me too, right? <laughs> and, I, you know, and, and, and to feel like you can come as you are and that there's something that you're to be a part of. And it's not just about what happens here. It's what happens all week and it happens all through the community and world. And so uh, we're going to take the next two months. And this is, this, okay, so this is my third assumption. One, you're here to celebrate Easter. Two, New Life's your church. Or you're here with somebody, it's their church. Or you're checking us out. The third is this, is that, um, that you want to be a part of a community that you love. Right? I mean, anybody here, you're like, you know where I want to live? I want to live somewhere where I hate. That would be great. I want to have a job I don't like, I want to complain about it every day. Man, this is like, that'd be awesome, okay? No, we want to be somewhere where it feels like I love where I live. And so we're going to take the next two months, and all we're going to do is this is try to help everyone here discover why God placed you here and how you can love where you live, work, and play. Would it be worth your time if you took the next two months to discover that for the rest of your life? Okay, and I get a lot of people have got out of the habit of what happens on a Sunday. And so this is a great time to say, hey, let's start the habit again. Okay. I was thinking about what to say for this message, okay? And, and I was like, okay, how do you, like, because like every Easter, like you can't be like, you know, I'm going to do a different story this time. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, it's... It's pretty clear. This is the story you're going to do is Jesus gets crucified, buried, and then on Resurrection Sunday, he rises rise from the dead. So you, does, doesn't it, does it ever feel like on Easter you're going to a movie you've already seen? And I wonder for some people if that's what Easter is. Yeah, let's just like we all get dressed up and let's go watch a movie. We already know how it's going to end. And how exciting does that sound? Right? And is that like if you're a follower of Jesus, is that your job? Like to see, can you talk someone into watching a movie again? Like, no, really, it's different this time. There's different actors. You're going to love it. It's great. They've modernized it. Okay. Um, 
And so I, I just, I, so I was thinking about how do I talk about this message? And I was thinking about, you know, um, what happens when you just watch the same movie? And, and, or what about this? Anybody here, you have a friend, and I call, let's call them the spoiler alert friend, right? Mm. Like they like want you to watch a movie, and then before you watch it, they spoil it. Yeah. Okay, like, like someone comes and says, hey, you know what? You've got to see the new Spider-Man, right? <laughs> no way home. This is, I mean, you're going to love it. Like, well, I just, I don't, I haven't seen any of them. I mean, okay, I guess I'll go. Like, no, listen, no, you got to go. You're going to go. I actually, I bought your ticket. You got to come. And then like you go to the movie, you're sitting there and they're playing all the ads beforehand and all the movies and you got the popcorn. And at some point they look over and they go like, did you know that like a lot of people have played Spider-Man? And like, I didn't, I just thought Spider-Man did. (laughs) But they're like, no, a lot of people. And I didn't realize this is like, this is like a tense subject. I didn't know it was a tense subject. Like, like who's the best Spider-Man? Mm. Like, like some people are like, it's Tobey Maguire. Mm. It's like, or Tom Holland is the best. I didn't know Andrew Garfield was Spider-Man. Mm. I thought he was the 20th president of the United States, but <laughs> that was a bad joke. That's a bad joke. I, was, I shouldn't have told that one. Right. Okay, but okay, so different people played Spider-Man. And so you're sitting there in the movie, you're eating popcorn, and you're like, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. Different people played Spider-Man. And then they say this. Man, in this movie, there's a moment where all of the Spider-Men show up in the same scene. And you're like, thank you, spoiler alert friend. You've just ruined the movie for me. Right? Like, where were you when I was sitting there to watch Sixth Sense? And they're like, it's been dead the whole time. (laughs) By the way, go see Star Wars with me because Darth Vader is Luke's dad. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. They're like, hey, you want to see Batman? You're like, don't ruin it for me. Like, I'm going to ruin it. It's really long. Um, so there's, just, there's, just, there's something about when you take the suspense out and you already know how it's going to end that you're just like, it's just not that exciting. And is that how people feel about the message of Easter? Mm-hmm. I already know it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like boring. Like we say, Jesus is risen. And then some people say, he's risen indeed. And some people are thinking, so what? Is that Easter? And what if it's something more? Mm-hmm. Like, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Isn't there something inside of us that longs for it to be? It's got to be something more. Like, it's got to be a better s- story, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And so this year I've been looking at this, and I started to recognize as I was reading the Bible, and I was reading the story of Easter, and I read what happened with the story of Easter, and I started to realize the first followers of Jesus did not think it was a movie they'd already seen before. And when they passed it on, they didn't think it was just something that happened in the past. They said, no, no, no. This isn't this that the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. It's better. It's that the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead, He's doing it again. And He's doing it in me. And He can do it in you. He's going to do it all over this world. And He's going to make everything new. Man, that would make you say, indeed, not so what? Can you imagine? That'd be like going to a movie, and somewhere in the movie, you're in the movie, and you're like, I did not expect this. <laughs> I, I, I don't, like, 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 wouldn't that change it? What if Easter, what if Resurrection Sunday is not where Jesus comes alive, it's where Jesus comes alive, and then we come alive too, and our communities come alive, and that's what I want to talk about. So I have a verse I want to go to. It's, it's Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And um, this is the, the Apostle Paul. So Paul, he ends up having a moment where he comes alive. He's a guy that, that he was, he's like, I don't believe this message. You know? you know, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's like, no, he didn't. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, well, actually he is. And this has changed my life. And so um, what he, he's writing to followers of Jesus in Rome. And he writes, he writes in Romans chapter 8 these words. So the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, listen to this, lives in you. That's Easter. It's Easter for everyone. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies. These, have you know, these bodies, they don't last forever, do they? They wear out, they get older, harder to take care of, and they pass on. He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit that's living within you. The same spirit lives in you. The spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. That's Easter. 
lives in you? Wow, now that would change some things. Now, when, when we talk about the Spirit of God, okay, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Again, we say, here's God. God. The early followers are Jesus. They're like, God's really big. He's personal. How personal? I don't know. He's like three persons in one God. He's super personal. He's God the Father, God the Son, because he came here, God the Holy Spirit, and he's everywhere. But when you talk about spirit, often we're just like, I don't really know how to get my head around spirit, right? Like, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do you mean by spirit? And so there's some words I hear in culture that sometimes I go like, was it like that? Like, one of the things I'm hearing people say is the word vibe. Have you heard that? Mm-hmm. Vibe. Like, man, I really like their vibe. They got a cool vibe. Like, yeah, I got some weird vibes from them. Which if they said it about you, just like, you're doing something. You need to stop. And, and so the word vibe, kind of interesting, the word vibe, actually, there's, a, there's an instrument. Did you know this? Called a, a, a vibaphone that actually is a percussion instrument used in jazz. Mm-hmm. Has a, a echoing effect, this vi- vibrato that kind of goes out. And I, I think about, like, spirit's a little bit like that. It's like, like, it, it, like, like you, it, it hits you and it keeps going, right? Mm-hmm. Right? There's this, there's, a sense of, there's a sense of this, which is interesting if you think about with sound, because, because when, when, when the Bible talks about the spirit, you have to go not just to the New Testament, you go to the Old Testament, you actually go to the beginning, it's Genesis. You're like, that's the first book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and formless. And what? Darkness, right? Darkness was there, right? And the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the earth, and God said, let there be light. Some theologians believe it's actually God's song. And some would say, no, it's like an instrument and a sound that actually echoed out, and the vibrations created everything. Huh. But then, you know, you think about vibe, it's emotional. You can kind of, you, know, you feel somebody else's vibe. But, but isn't the spirit more? There's something that's more personal. Uh, another word I hear sometimes is the word force. I believe in a, like a higher force. This, you know, may the force be with you. All right, you know, someone was waiting for me to say that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, you, you were looking for that. And, and, and when we think about the word force, okay, is I like it because it talks about power. There's power that goes beyond me, okay? There's a power that goes, it, like, there's a power that, it actually, it, it actually, there's a power that causes me to do something beyond my normal abilities. Mm-hmm. But apparently, if you've seen the movie, there's a dark side too, right? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Is that spirit? Mm-hmm. An impersonal force? Mm-hmm. When we talk about the spirit, we're actually not talking about a vibe. Although there's some, it's like the vibe is like pointing. There's, it's like this, but more. And we're not talking about a force, but it's like force, like, no, there's power, but there's, some, we're actually talking about a person. We're actually, we're actually talking about God's presence. If you want to know what's missing in this world, in your life, in our families, it's the presence of God. That's the spirit that raised Christ from the dead that's raising you. Okay, so let me give you a couple examples, okay? So, all right, so you start flipping through a Bible. Bible, 66 books, okay? One book, but then a lot of other books. And really two parts, you know? First part, Old Testament. Second part, New Testament. Jesus is right there in the middle, okay? Pointing to him. Then we get to read about him. In the Gospel of John, okay, that's like there's four. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke. In the Gospel of John, there's these personal encounters. I think like John, you know, he's the disciple. He's like, Jesus really loved me a lot, <laughs> Right? So I think he wanted everyone to know that God's personal. Mm-hmm. And so what you have is you have not only miracles and teachings, you actually have these personal conversations. I think, could God want a conversation with us? There's a moment in John chapter 3 where there's a guy by the name of Nicodemus. He's a teacher of Israel. He's a religious leader. He's also known as a Pharisee. I'll tell you what that is in a second. And he comes to Jesus at night for a conversation. And, you know, we often, you know, we often wondered, like, Nick at night, like, what, why is he doing this? And, um, and, and one of the things could be is he's avoiding people, right? He could be protecting his, his reputation. I'm a teacher. I'm an important person. And I don't want people to know I'm talking to Jesus like I might be interested. Which, do we do things to protect our reputation? Of course, now, it's interesting, though, is I've also read, though, that some people say maybe that's not that. Like, maybe he was just wanting to have an uninterrupted conversation with, with Jesus. Because mm. sometimes, you know, like, if you, especially if you've got kids, you're like, yeah, sometimes they got to go to sleep before you can have an uninterrupted conversation. 
You would, you would have it at night. Or maybe it's both. If you go, okay, that's in chapter 3. If you go right before, so like, well, what's, because it's all to be read together. What happened right before? I'd never noticed. Mm-hmm. Jesus cleanses the temple. And you're like, say more? <laughs> well, okay, let me explain. So Jesus goes into the temple for them, okay, for, many, for the Jewish people. This is like, presence of God is here. It's in this building. And then there's people who want to worship God who come to the temple. And then there's people who are there going, well, if they want to come and they need a sacrifice, and they, it's gonna, they're making money off of people wanting to worship God. Mm-hmm. And there's corruption. Mm-hmm. Then he asks you, is there corruption in the American church? Yeah. And what would Jesus do? Mm-hmm. Well, I can tell you what he did then. He started pushing over the tables or the money changers. He took and made a whip, okay? And he started to drive out the people who were doing this. And he says that my father's house would be a house of prayer, but you've made it into a den of thieves. Now, here's the thing is, if you're a Pharisee and you see Jesus do this, what are you thinking? Okay, so who are the people that thought God was all about the temple, it actually was not the Pharisees. It was the Sadducees. Like, yeah, they had two parties there too. Sadducees were people in power, but they had mixed into the power of Rome and the ways of Rome. And the Pharisees saw the lack of morality that was happening in their people group and said, listen, we need to bring morality back. They're the good guys. They're the ones saying, listen, we should not be doing the immoral stuff that's happening in the world, so let's be moral. Believing that if everyone would obey the law for one day, then the kingdom of God could come back. Nicodemus had to have seen this and gone, finally, this is our guy. Let's have him run as our, like, our representative, right? And he's meeting with Jesus at night. So why did, that's why he comes to him and he says to him, well, I'll give you my translation. We, um, we're pretty sure you're from God. I mean, we've seen the signs and miracles, and we're like, we like you. And Jesus' response isn't like, I, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't say thank you. What does he do? He says to him, uh, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. He's speaking to the longings in Nicodemus' heart for a better story. I get, like, you might be living in America, and you might see immorality, and you wish for a better story. Right? And don't we want Jesus to be on our team? Mm-hmm. So why is he asking us to be? And what is born again? Is he mm-hmm. calling us to Easter? Mm-hmm. For the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead to also raise us? Mm-hmm. If you have morality and you don't have the presence of God, what do you have? He says it to him twice. A little bit different ways. Nicodemus is confused. He's like, I'm a grown man. Uh, my mom, I do not want to tell her this. And Jesus says in John 3, 8, he says, these words, he says, the wind blows wherever it wills, and so it is with the Spirit of God. You, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. So it is with everybody born of the Spirit. The word spirit and wind is actually interchanged through Scripture, as if God is somehow moving that way. Which is interesting because in the beginning, the Spirit is hovering over the earth and God says, and this echoing out, then he, what does he do? The Spirit of God takes, takes, takes dirt and breathes went breath into it. And we have human beings. Makes a garden, which, like, that's awesome. Takes the humans he made, sticks them in the garden, right? And what does God do? Gives them a job. Cultivate, right? Make it better. Make it beautiful. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? And then what does it say he does? He just stands up in heaven and just kind of watches. No! He comes and he walks, moves among his people in the cool of the day. Some of your Bibles say breeze. The Spirit is still moving. Nicodemus, I know the longing in your heart for a better story, but it's not going to come by our human effort of morality. We're missing God's presence. And it's bigger. 
The story is bigger than Israel. It's bigger than you, Nicodemus. It's bigger than Israel. It's bigger than America. It's bigger than a brand of a church. For He didn't say God so loved you. He said God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world or point an accusing finger, but that through him we all might be saved. It's God's like, I want to bring my presence back to this earth. And it's here, but you don't recognize it. And that space that you feel, that is the, the longing that you have is because of the emptiness that my space, that my presence used to fill. But it's not there because we've sinned and rebelled. And like Adam and Eve, we find ourselves, what? Covering ourselves, hiding and blaming one another. And he's pursuing us. Just keep reading. I mean, this is the whole story. It's the whole story. Very next chapter. You have another person, right? The Samaritan woman, woman at the well, right? And I love it because why? Jesus gets there before she does. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just telling you, God's spirit is, uh, he's ahead of us. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm going to work. God's like, already there. Mm -hmm. They're like, they kick God out of schools. God's like, nope, can't. Mm -hmm. Impossible. Mm -hmm. He's here. I mean, think about this. When Jesus shows up, what's his message? Repent, which is basically turn and go a different direction. You need to think about life different. Repent for the kingdom of God is where? It's right in front of your face. My presence is here, and I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm here. And what are we doing? We're filling our lives with other things. I try to, Nicodemus, if I could fill it with enough religion. No, you can't. If I fill it with enough morality, you can't. There's this woman, and she comes to the well in the middle of the day, which, I mean, we read it, and we're like, well, sure. Like, I get coffee in the morning, in the afternoon, and probably a little bit right before I go to sleep. <laughs> in that culture, you would get water in the morning. I mean, that's what you would do. That's what, that's what the, unless you're avoiding people, then you might go in the middle of the day because no one would be there. Isn't it interesting that God doesn't avoid us? And he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Jesus is sitting on the well. He's sitting there. It's like he's waiting for us to like finally come to a point where we're like, okay, I need your presence. And the woman shows up. And if you read it, like we read it with Western eyes, but what's interesting, when I talk to people who have Eastern eyes, they're like, do you read? What's happening is actually playful banner, and in some cultures could even be considered flirtation. Can I have a drink from your bucket? Like, have I used that line before? She's like, why are you a Jew speaking to me? A why are you a man? She's like, what's going on? Like, you, should you be doing this? Like, the normal thing would be this. He gets up and walks away. She gets water, and then he comes back. He sits there. It's the middle of the day. She's talking to him. Jesus is like, well, if you asked me, I would give you living water. You'd never thirst again. I'm like, that's a good line, too. <laughs> Like, you, this is playful. Even to the point where he says, he says to her, go get your husband. And she says, I have none. Do you get how this could be seen? It's the reason why when the disciples show up, they're like, I don't know how I feel about Jesus doing this. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, what? No, you've had five. And the one you're with now is not even your husband. And that got awkward. In between where we are, and God's presence filling our lives is probably an awkward conversation that God wants to have with us. And maybe other people might want to have with us too, but we're a little afraid to have it. Do we need an awkward conversation? Does America need an awkward conversation with God? She changes the subject, which, right? Like, that's what I would do. And she makes it about a religious issue, right? I mean, she just retweets something else. And um, next thing you know, it's like, hey, I don't, where are we supposed to worship? Are we supposed to worship? You say that the holiest place, the temple, is in Jerusalem, while we Samaritans say that the holy place is Mount Gerizim, which that's where it was originally. You guys got it wrong. And, and so where is it supposed to be? And she brings up a popular religious debate of their day. And are Christians suckers for that? We're just like, well, I'm just, I, I don't have to go to church to have a relationship with God. No, you do, you do, you, you I don't, I don't, 
I don't have to come every Sunday. No, you, 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 you really do. We're, we're, we're taking attendance. Jesus doesn't answer her the way she thinks she, he's going to answer her. Mm-hmm. What does he say? He says, it doesn't, time is coming. It doesn't matter where you are. Because mm-hmm. you, could, you could come on Sunday and still miss God's presence. And you could be on your own. You're still missing God's presence. Mm-hmm. And you could try to fill that space with as much love from other people, but you're still missing the love of God that created you. Mm-hmm. I'm the one that knows how to breathe life into your spirit, nobody else. And he says, the time is coming when those who worship God will worship him in spirit. There's the word again. In spirit and truth. The same spirit of God that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. She leaves her stuff there. I mean, this is a woman with a reputation. She's clearly avoiding people. Mm-hmm. And she leaves everything, goes back to the village, and says, come and meet a man who knows everything, who told everything about me that I've ever done. Which I was just thinking about that. Like one time I was interviewing for a job at a church, and their last question, does this sound like a question for a church application? It said the last question was this, have you ever done anything that if it were made known would be an embarrassment to you or the church? And I said, like, yeah, like lots. And I said, and they only had this one little space. I was like, can I use the back? Like, is there extra paper? Are you kidding me? There's so much. There's so much, if you knew. And there's something about when you have a real encounter with God's presence that you stop worrying about what everybody thinks about you. And you stop avoiding and you stop protecting your reputation because that love and acceptance and belonging you were made for is alive and it's in, inside of you. It's inside of you. And this, this Easter, I didn't want you to come and hear a message that sounds like, yeah, I've heard that. Because really, the women on Sunday morning did go to the tomb. And, and, and the, the stone was rolled away. And they went in inside, you know, and the angel spoke to, spoke to them and said, you know, he's, he's no longer here, he's risen. Mm-hmm. And they were like, wow. They went and told the disciples, and, you know, Peter and John go running. I don't know what age they are, because if they were 50, they'd have walked. <laughs> I, I get, I'll get there. Like, if he's risen, he's going to still be risen when I get there, <laughs> right? This is, it's not going to change here in the next few minutes, right? And, and, and John, I don't know why, but he has to let everybody know I got there first. Yeah. I for sure got there first. Peter was second. And um, they get in there and they see, and, and, and he, he's not there. And they go away and they, and they wonder, what does this mean? When we say that Christ is risen from the dead, it doesn't, it's not so what? And when we say indeed, it means he's, he's doing it in me. When we say indeed, we're saying he's, he's doing it today in our communities. I see it in my family. I see it when the lights of the eyes of my kids come on. They start to believe in it, and they start to feel God's presence. Not like a vibe in a worship song that I get emotional at summer camp, but a presence that lives with you through the highs and lows of life. Mm-hmm. The, the, it says that Mary Magdalene was there, and she actually thought it was the gardener. Mm-hmm. I love that because God's like, I'm just, I love gardens. Mm-hmm. I love gardens. You know, when he, 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 he's the one that made the garden. Mm-hmm. He's the one that placed humans in the garden. When Jesus prayed, toughest decision ever in his life, he was in a garden. In Revelation, when God's presence comes fully to this world, in a new heavens and new earth, and everybody here, and those who are not here, maybe even this year, have gone on to be with God, are given new bodies. This is that we're in a garden city. And what makes it a garden city? It isn't me, and it isn't you, it's his presence. That's what we're missing. That if you're here and you're hearing this and you're missing his presence, you're like, just know this, that longing that you have for something more, that longing that you have for a better story. I want you to hear this. Don't miss this because like I really got to say this right. The longing that you have did not start with you. Mm-hmm. The longing is actually God's longing to be with you. And all you're feeling are the echoes Mm -hmm. of the empty space. Mm -hmm. 
I remember uh, I was 19 years old, sitting on the sidewalk on a curb in Kirkland overlooking the water of Seattle, having studied religion, <laughs> and yet feeling the absence of God's presence in my life. That's a tough place to be. I mean, you, if you're new to all this, you're like, oh, I just knew. I just didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Right? But what's hard is if you've heard, like you think you've seen the movie, but somehow you actually missed what it was all about. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting there, and I, I have a moment where I'm just, I can feel the longing, the absence. And in that moment, I didn't reach out for God. That, that's the irony. He reached out to me. And words that I had heard and remembered came back to me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He may lie, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And then that next line, I just it, it broke me. Restores my soul. Last few years have been tough, but has it taken us to a place where at least we could stop and say, we can't fill this space (laughs) with entertainment, with materialism, and we can be angry and upset, and that's not going to fill it either, (laughs) right? And religion won't, and listen to me, morality won't, and five relationships won't. (laughs) Only God can fill that presence and that space because he's the one to put it there. <laughs> He's the one that made your soul. So I want to say a prayer for you. Uh, the early followers of Jesus, they're trying to figure out, you know, Easter was actually not something they celebrated once a year. They celebrated it every day. So for them, it was Easter for everyone. It's not something that happened in the past. It was happening now. The Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Same Spirit. Mm-hmm. And they celebrated it like every day. And then once a week, they would come together. And so I get that a lot of people have lost the meaning of Sunday. And so we're like, I just, I just don't really. The reason why Christians gathered on Sundays was because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. So they're like, if he could get out of the tomb, I could probably get off the couch. Right? I could, I could, right? 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 It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. I could probably, right? And so, so, so they would actually, for them, it wasn't a day off. Do you know that they worked on Sundays? Their day off was Saturday. And Saturday nights, they would often get together for a meal. But Sunday, they would, they had work. But they were like, let's just, and so they get together. And it wasn't long. And some of you are like, praise Jesus. It was not long. And sermons weren't long. They're shorter than what probably I'm doing right now. And, but they would come together because they were just like, we've got to remember what this is. Because if we forget this, it's going to turn into religion. And then our kids won't want it. And our grandkids won't even remember it. And so we, it's got to be real to us, and it's got to be about presence. And so we're going to make sure. And so every Sunday, they would gather and be like, hey, he's risen. Not, not so what? Indeed. Indeed. And then they go to work. They're like, ah, oh, he's alive in our community. He beat me to work. <laughs> Everywhere I volunteer, he's already there. Yeah. Going through our schools, moving. Look at that. Spirit of God. But it did turn into an annual event because they're like, man, there's a lot of people in our community that aren't celebrating with us. Like, wouldn't it be cool if they did? And so what the Christians did is they looked around and they saw, oh, hey, look at this. Once a year, our whole community would celebrate this thing called spring. They're like, oh, how do we explain what Easter's like? Like, how do we explain what resurrection's like? Like, how do we explain that, like, there's things that are dead that come alive, and Jesus was dead, and then he became alive, and the Spirit of God took me, being spiritually dead, to spirit, they spring, that's it. Let's take spring, let's take a day in spring, they're like, which one? We're like, we don't know, let's just, let's just let's surprise everybody every year. <laughs> no one, I know there's math on it, but it's like calculus, and so like, it's hard, right? Like, right? I don't know, there's like two of them, I think, and the second one, I'm getting stuff on sale. And so, but they're like, let's take, one, let's take one of those Sundays every year. And that'll be the Sunday that we that go, hey, let's invite everybody. Mm-hmm. Let's invite everybody to be part of it. And so they started this celebration called Easter. And um, this Resurrection Sunday, what they would do to like go, okay, what should we preach 
So it doesn't look like a movie that people have already seen. And they said, let's do this. Let's have people who've received Christ this year get baptized. Mm -hmm. If they see people get baptized, mm -hmm. where they go under the water dead and up out of the water alive, maybe they'll think that Easter might be for them too. All across New Life campuses today, mm -hmm. what are we doing? We're going to be baptizing people mm -hmm. who've said yes to Christ. And they say, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in me. I want to say a prayer for you. If you've been feeling like you've been missing God's presence, maybe your soul needs to be restored because it's been broken. Uh, maybe you just like honestly have never felt like God was real. But you're like, there's something inside of you that's responding to the longing in the heart of God to have relationship with you. I want to say a prayer for you. We also want to pray for everyone being baptized and all their family and all their friends. I think baptisms are the birthday parties of the church, and we're going to celebrate big. Father in heaven, thank you. Every single day is Easter for us. Every day we celebrate that in a world where there's sickness, death, dying, violence, war, hatred, and brokenness, there's spring. There's an empty tomb. There's power. And the person of the Holy Spirit uniting our hearts to yours, opening our hearts to your spirit to bring us alive. And then through your power, we are becoming the church. Your hands and feet in a community. And we're watching you take something that's been broken and making a garden city again. God, I pray for everybody who right now is feeling empty and that they are missing something. There's got to be something. They might have tons of success. They might have everything they've ever wanted except for they're missing your presence and there's a deep emptiness in their soul. Would you in this moment, would you, would you, would you, would you help them? Would you help them to hear your spirit calling? And that they would, would hear your spirit calling them alive, the sound, the moving, the echo, that, that spirit raising them alive to you, God. May they feel your presence right now restoring their soul. For those, God, who've drifted from you, the calling back. And God, today we, we pray for those who are being baptized and for their families and their friends and those who are, God, we celebrate with them. There's joy. There's joy today. Because you, what you did 2,000 years ago is still happening today. And God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our world. And we pray, God, would you help us to have the courage and faith to believe. You're going to do it again this year. And you're going to do it everywhere. And everywhere we go, you've already been. <laughs> and you're there and you're meeting us. And that we would say, God, yes, it's resurrection. He is risen. He is risen. Indeed.
faithfulness You're never changing You're never changing, Lord Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 